simplified some job code, we share some, we reduced shared config, and we actually did the same for like the search service as well. Um, so it's not like we're talking directly to Elastic Search or you know, the Atlas or other uh, search engine. But our team is a privacy team, and the main reason we adopted Amundsen was to understand our company's data. Um, so we added the concept of like a PI semantic type and a data subject type. Effectively, these are like enumerations that define precisely what PI exists in a column. Like if it's an email address, a social security number, a phone number, and what data subject it is. Like at Square, we have sellers and buyers among many other types of data subjects. Um, and these are all searchable as like a first class column property. Um, we're not actually using tags for this. We reserve tags for like user generated annotations. And uh, Alyssa is kind of showing how we can search uh, for these properties. And you can see it in our in our view. We have data subject type and PI semantic type there. Um, so it makes it easier to find like what tables have certain types of PI. But so it's not just that we have all this data, but we also like to drive purposeful access control. Um, basically, only having access to tables that you really need for your for your job, especially as PI is concerned. Um, so we define the concept of a purpose, which is like an enumerated legal approved reason to access specific types of PI. Like we have an example, um, you know, we have Hogwarts counselors, we have a such description there, and we have like a list of semantic types that they're allowed to use. And then we use this along with a capability, which is a combination of a purpose and a data subject. In this case, we have, you know, the, the data subject would be like wizard students. Um, and then within our company's like identity management system, we link groups of users, like in this case, we link the counselors group to certain capabilities. And then we regularly generate access grants for, for appropriate users to tables that contain data access capabilities. Uh, like for, below, we have this access grants list, like a couple example tables that we would or would not grant access to. Uh, so you could scroll down, but there you go. Not, not that far. <laughs> there we go. Uh, so, you know, like if you had to table all evaluations that contains evaluations on wizard students and wizard faculties, we wouldn't grant access because these counselors only have access to student evaluations. Mm. Our emergency contacts, like again, these are emails about parents which are not approved for access by the counselors with this purpose. But student evaluations would be granted access to. Uh, so it's a little quick. Any quick questions or good to go? Move on. Okay. Alyssa can take it away. Cool. Um, so Josh sort of talked about how we added this idea of like data subject types and PI semantic types. And those are things that we are tagging at the time that we're importing data. Um, but we also wrote some code that sort of um, flags potentially sensitive data. So you can see here, there's a not so beautiful little UI uh, tag here that says, hey, this column was flagged for possibly containing sensitive information. It could include a person's name. Um, and we have basically a big YAML file that uh, guesses at whether something's sensitive, like is the column name address, is the column name uh, social security number, like those are obvious examples. Um, but we added a page called um, review. Um, and here you can see uh, the columns that have been flagged that have not been like resolved. So you saw a couple examples on the last page where it said, okay, this was a full name. And yes, it, that's definitely the semantic type that it is. And it didn't show a flag there. These are columns where we are thinking, hey, this could have sensitive information and no one has confirmed whether that's the case or not. So the first one on this review page is a, a column called social security SSN. So if we go to this table, um, I can come and say, yes, I think that's social security number. I can say yes. Um, when I refresh it, uh, now it's tagged as social security number. And using the system that Josh describes for access control, we can specifically say um, somebody only has access to um, the data subject type of, per of like wizard mixed with the semantic type of like name and email, and they would not be able to see this column. Um, so we're doing like column level access control using this. Um, along with that, we built out, um, I gave sort of a little screenshot in the document that I shared. Um, actually, I have it on here as well. Um, we 
created this idea of an access report, um, which is mostly to help us take this concept of roles that we have internally um, and help us uh, refine like access levels. So uh, this report is showing you, okay, who had access to a table and who didn't actually use that access. And then that allows us to remove access that is unused. Um, it also allows us to see like, oh, that's weird that somebody was accessing it who we would not expect, um, things like that. Um, yeah, I think that was everything that we were gonna present if anyone has questions. I also included screenshots from our Neo4j, although we are switching to Gremlin now, if you wanted to understand a little bit more about how the nodes um, like work together in the graph database. Um, so one question here, you mentioned that you're working on the access report and those kind of things, but um, I, I haven't actually seen those things like, hey, is, is this person, um, so suppose if I don't really have the access to any of the particular data set or the table, uh, would that be somewhere visible on the Amundsen for me, that we don't really have access to this data source? Oh, that's something that we are adding in now, like visibility within um, Amundsen to tell you whether you can access the data or not, yeah. And uh, would that mean that uh, you would still be able to request access for that particular table? Um, I think that is a feature that you guys are adding in a Munson, right? I think that on our end for our use cases, I don't think that we would necessarily support that. We haven't like discussed it. Yeah, well, we have a different system. Yeah, yeah. So, so some of some of our um, uh, access, are, a lot of our access control is handled by a homebrew internal system that is separate. Um, so the request flow for that has been implemented in a different system and not in a month's end itself. Um, but um, the idea is that that kind of system should be pretty, uh, we basically are leaving it open and flexible for other folks to add. Uh, we have specific requirements, um, but other companies may not. Yes, sounds good. Yeah, it's really nice that you're uh, taking care of the access part. I really like the idea. Yeah. And uh, of course, the request access part is uh, is on our roadmap, but we haven't actually started working on that yet. Yeah, yeah. Hopefully, we'll be able to start upstreaming some of this stuff that we've done. That would be super nice. So I have a question. So uh, once you find out like a PRI columns for certain table, do you have an internal uh, lineage system to populate those kind of information? which I like, share the same upstream columns, stuff like that? We, do, we haven't actually built that out yet. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, the uh, representative from Snowflakes, I think, dropped off the line. Um, however, we are actively trying to get Snowflake to uh, work with us so that we can get that. So, work in progress. Um, there's also, I think, depending on how you're looking for uh, data lineage, um, I don't know how other companies are, but we have uh, a bunch of disparate uh, data systems. And um, I don't know, like, we might be a little bit unusual in that we have a bunch of different systems. And so being able to build lineage for that is potentially more difficult for us than it is for other folks. Oh, and speaking of which, I, I meant to demo that we are also tracking column level reads. So Snowflake has this new feature where you can get access log information like at a column level. And so that is how we're powering the like role access report that I was showing. Oops, sorry, sorry. 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 Um, and that is another thing that we want to upstream as soon as, I don't know when they're releasing that as like a full feature. Um, you can see here, I gave a screenshot of, this is like a user doing column level reads and um, using the number of times that they're reading a column per day to also tell us something about whether the usage is normal or not. Yeah. Um, and then when you were saying you prevent a column from being read, is that the fact that the column won't even show up in Amazon if you don't have access or the column will show up in Amazon, you just won't be able to read from that column? Oh, I'm we're talking about like your ability to read it like in Snowflake. Got it. So one of the things we've been trying to do is that we're harnessing the power of Amundsen to basically be able to make access decisions for other kinds of data stores. Um, so our ability to do data grants in Snowflake, um, for some of, for those of you who also use Snowflake, you may realize, you may see that it's pretty kind of coarse. So it's like you can only grant access to like a table level. 
Um, so we've been working uh, with our data infrastructure team to build uh, more granular access control um, so that people don't have to learn or know what database or table they need access to. They can instead say, hey, I need access to some names, I need some access to some addresses, and uh, the grant system will automatically set that up uh, and um, create the system, uh, basically create a way for um, Snowflake users to access automatically instead of granting it to everything. Makes sense, thank you. Digging, uh, sorry, uh, digging, digging into uh, Tal's question a little deeper. So instead of putting that uh, metadata on the column level, if that column or that same data is showing up in different tables, is the idea, is the current setup now that they would be treated as like separate um, tasks that you would have to review? And then in the future, would they be like populated, automatically populated in the future or? Oh yeah, this is all stuff that we're iterating on right now um, because I think the idea is I don't want to we don't want to create like a million flags that somebody has to manually yeah. review. Um, yeah. So this is what we are currently working on to make better. Cool. Yeah, part of the long term goal is like it's going to be detecting things that we don't catch otherwise, not yeah. like the uh, blanket fallback for everything. Yeah, and yeah. we're also working manually with teams to have them help us tag these column so it's not just all based on the flags sorry josh were you about to say something yeah no worries i'm just gonna say like uh what we haven't fully dived deep into lineage yet like that's kind of a big question uh but for instance if it was just exactly a copy for a column for another column like ideally we'd link those so they have the same like semantic types automatically for free and like, flags and all that good stuff yeah, yeah. Uh, on, on the on the flip side like as soon as if we know that they have the same data subject and the same, sorry, same data subject and same semantic type, uh, that grant access um, should be done automatically. So you don't necessarily like, so long as that initial like, okay, I've tagged this all properly is set up from the start. Um, future uh, access requests uh, are pretty easy and are all like um, synchronized. And we're also happy to answer questions on Slack if anyone has like follow-up questions after the meeting too. Yeah. Sure. I have a quick question. That um, review screen that you showed, is that available to, like, how do you control who has access to, um, to say whether something is or is not PII? Is that just open to anybody or is, do you restrict that to a certain set of user types? Yeah, so these are features that are in flight, like in progress right now, but the idea is that you will only be able to see <clears throat> data that you have ownership over to, uh, to be able to approve or deny a flag. And this is all like logged essentially, like if you said yes or no, that's being saved. Like who is the person who said yes to this content being flagged in a certain way or not. Okay. And you showed us the like PII semantic types that you have. How extensible is that to other types of um, categories or flags, or are there other types that you support currently? It, it, it should be a, um, it should be like totally extensible. I think we have a, a set of enums, and we can just like add more to it. Yeah. So we have it. a huge list for both semantic type and data subject type, but we also have things that we are going to work towards, like data security type, like is this column encrypted, um, those mm -hmm. sorts of things, which can tell us a little bit more, like if it's PII, but then it is fully anonymized in some way or encrypted or something, is it as sensitive as plain text PII, for example? Okay. And, and this, this, this is really cool, so thank you. And, and part of the motivation, um, if it's not clear why there's a distinction between the semantic type and the security type is that, um, uh, at least for us, but I'm um, not sure for others, um, there are certain kind of uh, legal obligations or responsibilities of you still need to know what the data is, even though it may be protected. And if it ever were to like make it out into the wild, um, it's like hard for hackers to like get to. So that that's partially why we made that separate distinction. Um, some people may say, oh, you know, uh, an address in plain text uh, versus an address encrypted, we will have those as different semantic types, but that was not the decision we came to. Does that make sense? Yeah, that absolutely makes sense.
Other uh, question? Yeah, one question, Mark. This is this is for you guys at Lyft. Uh, I remember last time you uh, you guys presented something that someone can actually request the change in the content for the description for the column names and those kind of things. One of your interns was working on that part. Is that something related to this part? Like, hey, the the content review or the flex review. Um, can we actually use the same kind of screens for those things, for those two things? Because of course, if someone would be suggesting the changes in the content in case of you, in case of your feature, there would be definitely um, a page or something like that where the owner would be able to review that and say, yeah, you're suggesting the right thing. Tamila, uh, are you on the line? Um, yeah, we should be able to do that in terms of um, that notification system that we created right now, it's all email based. Uh, so as long as folks have like written an email client, they'll be able to utilize that. Um, and it's sort of, it's structured such that you can add new types of notifications. Uh, so I don't foresee that being a difficult um, thing to do if anyone wants to start uh, contributing different types of notifications or just uh, modifying their internal notifications to just Add, add different types. Um, if people are curious uh, technically, like how to do that or what code they have to change, then just reach out in the Slack channel. That sounds good to me. We'll do uh, one last call for questions and then move on to the next item after that. Um, in that case, I can channel Luis. Uh, the question was, the review functionality looks really nice. Is this something that will be contributed to the project, or is it covered by the upstream comment? Oh, yeah. This is definitely something that we are in the progress of slowly upstreaming enough infra like code changes so that we can properly contribute this to Munson. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, that would be phenomenal. Um, I think this is really great stuff. And the community would love this being upstreamed. Also, I think this would make a really awesome blog post as well. And your doc is already an amazing start to that. So that would be something amazing as well. Definitely. Thanks. Cool. So if there are any more questions, please contact Square folks on Slack. Um, thank you so much for putting the thought and time and preparing this demo and sharing with us. This is like definitely a really great addition to the project. Cool. Uh, so next item we have is from Marcus on Simpress to show their work on the internal UI. Hey, hello. Thanks a lot for the opportunity to um, present a little bit what we're doing or about to roll out. Um, and also thanks for this community to have such a nice community and collaborate. I'm really excited also just uh, hearing the presentation uh, just now and like what's coming up and uh, it will definitely be useful to us, um, you know, it's everyone works on different angles of, of the whole problem space, but um, but I'm glad to to be here. Anyway, so I, I pre have a short presentation. Um, on, let's see if that works. All right, can you see my screen? Yeah. All right. Um, so. I'm Marcus. Um, I'm the engineering lead of uh, Simba. That's the Simpress business analytics um, team responsible for you know, the data plat platform within Simpress. And um, let me quickly give you a little bit of context here, um, uh, like a two minute overview of who we are. Uh, so who is Simpress? Simpress is um, a company that invests into mass customization, uh, into business that uh, deal in the mass customization space. Uh, Vista print might be familiar to those in the US and there is many other logos around Europe and uh, even China that might be more familiar in other countries. Um, it's more or less upload and print business. Uh, you upload your graphics and you know from your t-shirt to your calendar and everything. So, so potentially many of you have used some services of some of those companies. Um, so Simpress Technology is a central team uh, that more or less builds and operates the mass customization platform. That's a platform that helps those businesses to connect together and leverage more than an individual business could do. Uh, Simplest Technology is over 300 people, most of them software engineers, and in many locations across US, Europe, and India. So who is Simba? Uh, Simba, the Simplest Business Analytics team, is uh, we have 21 um, team members in six locations. 
um, two of them around the Boston area, two of them in Mumbai and Bangalore, and then we have Barcelona and uh, Switzerland where I am currently based. All right, so let's dive a little bit into why we got there. Um, our focus is to build and operate a self-service data platform. So uh, even so our name uh, applies to that a little bit, uh, we are not doing analytics for users. So we are, we are offering a platform that others can hook on. Um, our topics are ingestion, sending event and batch data. I mean, no surprise, right? Everyone needs data in the data warehouse. Uh, storage, um, we have a, we call it private data warehouse. So each business gets a private data warehouse and we use Snowflake data sharing to uh, share data out to the businesses and leverage a lot of the privacy features through, uh, through that uh, data sharing. Uh, and a big part is also performance and lineage around the storage. Um, and consumption is uh, providing business analytics and data catalog function, data catalog, data discovery. That's, that's where Amazon comes into play. Our principles are <clears throat> uh, across the company, but also within the uh, business analytics uh, team. We are API first. Uh, so this is also Lyft Amazon was really a good solution. There's a lot of APIs uh, on the search meta or also directly on the front end available um, compared to other third party tools um, that focus on other aspects and might be suitable for other companies that integrate our needs. Um, and we really moved in the last one and a half years from an operations team to an engineering team. And this is also like one and a half years ago, we would not have been able to choose left, uh, but now with the current team, it's uh, we're really looking to adopting that and, and rolling that out. All right, so we actually <clears throat> use the word data discovery. For us, the main challenge is currently that the businesses and users discover the data, that they start to use more of the data. Um, all the privacy and security concern and all those features we will need and, and currently need, but uh, a, a big challenge is where is the data? Who is the owner of it and so on? Um, so what we decided is let's write a custom UI so we are a lot more flexible in what we're creating as uh, user experience. Uh, we have a, the data cataloging feature <clears throat> or the core features of um, tagging, tagging the data, describing them, um, you're using Amundsen. Um, and then we have other tools, user statistics, uh, diagnostics, um, uh, lineage that allows us then to integrate into that and provide a unique uh, experience that fits our needs. Um, one example is, for example, the data sharing. We have the Sempress data warehouse, and then we have 10 other data warehouses. We share the data out that are only relevant to that business. Um, so how do you describe them once, but have this description replicated 11 times or 10 times? So those are the type of challenges what we are looking at, and, and some of them are soft, and some of them are definitely in the very, very early stages. So let's look at that on the architecture side. Um, so at the top, like the user experience uh, is with the single page app that we it's custom developed based on our simple style guides. Uh, on the left side, you see, you know, what what is Amundsen Meta and Amundsen Search, which we are directly accessing. Uh, I think you might have seen a few weird questions from our side that we are not using the the front end, and uh, I'm open to discuss that whether we might have opportunities to actually twist that a little bit. Uh, we run that on AWS Fargate, more or less a Docker instance that AWS matches for us. Um, Nefo is on an EC2 currently, and Elasticsearch, we use the Amazon hosted Elasticsearch feature. Uh, and the meta ingestion task uh, goes out to Snowflake. That's roughly what your example is with some modifications to you know, scale out to 11 data warehouses and also include a little bit our custom user search and so on. Um, in addition to what our data discovery UI provides is local reports. Uh, and we use that, uh, what I mentioned, for diagnostics, for usage. And those are a little bit in the early stages. And those are mostly driven by uh, SIFT, is our Snowflake information filtering tool. It's based on Snowflake usage data, but also on query history and query insight, query parsing of our query history, what we're looking at, and, and actually identify the lineage. It's kind of a custom made tool, but we're able to kind of tell on per user on which um, columns and uh, tables were, were used. Um, looking into a little bit where we are, our thoughts are heading, not necessarily that this is fully locked down, is um, we want to definitely include a lot more directly, you know, our Snowflake information tool as an API to go again in this API first 
mode and uh, go less around you know standardized Luca report. I think it gives you, you a lot more integrated experience. And actually, I can show that afterwards on the UI how such an integrated experience would look like because if one such call already. Um, and here, this is not a high importance. On the other hand, it's the only thing where we have to run our own infrastructure is to, to use Neo4j. And I know there is a bunch of things out there that allow you to run this in a high availability cluster. At the same time, the cost uh, factor didn't really bias into that yet. So I think you know AWS Neptune came out. So it's an idea of potentially providing back to the community um, after a discussion with you of saying, hey, is, is this worthwhile to use other graph databases, especially ones that are completely serverless and can scale more or less with your money back in usage, uh, but not necessarily with your operational skills. All right, so we start a little bit our wish list or our thoughts, just iterating that in, in words. Um, so I think you have very well architected search and meta APIs, and I think actually we want to use more of that. Um, you know, the some iterations of authorization, authentication, I think there is a lot of thought already on certain things out. I think some of that is on the front end API, some on the back end. Um, also, uh, that, for example, the ingestion interacts with APIs instead of the database. Um, if that were API based, we could have gave it actually out to our developers and say, by the way, if you have a new thing, you can integrate directly and add a new table to the search and, and, and think of other databases than just the ones we are supporting. Uh, so this is a little bit the, the thing where we think of what's, what's our data platform looking like and, and, and having everything API based instead of direct uh, database based is interesting uh, uh, opportunities. Uh, multi tenants is a challenge what we are trying to solve somehow with those 10 businesses that are interacting. Uh, it's mostly a permission challenge what we are having and there is we haven't solved it out. Uh, sorted it out, who is able to see what data just from a pure business uh, standpoint, not even uh, from, from a security standpoint. Um, and the graph database I mentioned, it's more or less a little bit uh, nice to have. It's not really uh, one that drives a lot of business value. Um, all right, let's quickly look at a demo. Let's see if that works. So this is our UI. It's uh, kind of all our applications look like that within Simple Psychology. Um, and um, simple search as you have. I'm just going to search for a table that I know that exists. Uh, Marcus, uh, if you are showing us your screen, we aren't able to see it. We just see the. Demo. Oh, hold on, hold on. Let me see if. Let me refer. Thanks for telling me. That didn't do the right thing. I think that should work. Can you see that now? Yeah. All right. So I just searched for a table. Um, and you know, there might be obviously many results. Um, and you know, it's it's a little bit of copy of what you have, so that we, we went with you know the lowest hurdle of what to get for. Um, and on the details, here's a description, and we went with uh, some some editor to do um more or less specific uh, markdown editing. Um, and uh, this was one thing what you saw here is frequent users. And this is actually from our tool, what we're having. And this is our why we want to have API first and the user interface completely independent. We see who has accessed this database uh, most recently. For example, this one through Locker, I did two and a five queries. I think it's the last three months. Um, and, and those are the the real interesting insight uh, when you don't know who is who is actually that that user that queried my data, um, and we actually have the data already to do that on a column level. Um, we don't have yet visualization for that um, on the columns. Okay, this is not the most exciting uh, table with a JSON variety column, but uh, there's also there, there's some tables that have very long, and then you can very long number of columns you can search for. Let's say address, and you see all the address details. Um, but, but like this is just a simple search. Oops. And the analytics is there where we have live reports currently driven by Looker and sees the usage statistics of this table, uh, average execution time, which goes a little bit into diagnostics. Also, how were the data uh, accessed? Uh, through Looker, most of it, some through the Snowflake UI, and someone did something with data breaks. 
um, maximum execution time over the past three months, average queries per day. You know, it's not the most frequent table. And uh, then you actually see the whole query history, including from Snowflake, how many bytes were scanned, how many rows were produced. This allows you to see, hey, this was a full table scan versus here you actually had an index lookup and so on. Very drives them back to the user. Hey, you can do something different by providing different views on your table, different clustering keys. And again, it's not us managing centrally the um, performance across all the queries that might happen, but actually giving the power into the, the data providers who own that table and say, by the way, the 36 table uh, queries a day, I'm not investing time here versus, oh, it's a thousand queries a day. Yes, obviously I'm going to invest a lot of time. So I can quickly um, show you uh, here, for example, this is my tables. This is where I'm the data steward and my bookmarks uh, is which the ones I have bookmarked. I quickly show you a table, some of our shipment table and how often uh, that was queried and just shows you a little bit more complete picture of, um, um, of actual usage of something um, that is a little bit more more queried with the, like an average of 2,000 queries a day um, in a lot more diverse world. But I think this is really, really useful insight for a data owner of how the data were used. All right, I think that a, was a quick overview, a little bit of where we are. Uh, by the way, this is going to be rolled out over the course of the next few weeks. We plan it for next week. Not sure if we are going to achieve that, might be in, a, in two weeks and so on. And then uh, we'll iterate quickly. I think there's a four or five People are working full time currently on the from the Simba team on that. So I think in, in two, three months we'll hopefully be able to show yet another level of, of how that could look like. Awesome. Thank you, Marcus. Questions? So uh, hey, this is uh, Marcus. So that's fantastic demo, actually. So uh, I have one question for the Looker Analytics uh, view. So is it like uh, is an embedded uh, UI frame from Looker, or is actually like I saw you said have a run button. Do you like actually click some run uh, query and issue in Looker and get those results? For example, how do I get like all the query, how much row is scanning, like how much average query time? All this information actually is this stored somewhere? Mm -hmm. So Looker has an embed feature and. Um, Looker has also a single URL feature. So you can request at the Looker API, say, give me for this dashboard with this permissions exactly a URL that can be hit exactly once. Uh, so what we are doing is a lot of tricks in the back end that have been built up over the last three years. Um, we're leveraging that API, but we have an API in front of that that does a lot of authorization checks and sets the permission on, on the query. Um, and those permissions are set by an internal system, for example, to which um, it could be on which table do you have access. So data discovery, you are allowed to access the table, but you're not allowed to uh, see the usage statistics. Uh, we don't have those permissions yet, but we could have those and your looker would just show a zero line, even so someone else goes in and sees only his or her um, usage. And then another one goes in and sees the usage of the business that person is working on or across everything. So there's really multi-layer of, of permissions what we're working on Looker, but generally the technology is the Looker embed is the technology. They have such features and we have built a uh, tooling around that. Thanks. Other questions? Um, I'll ask one, Marcus. The the local reports that were generated on a per table basis um, are they like manually created for every table, um, or are they um, generated via an API? It's a single dashboard that we are creating once, um, and. This is exactly what our API does um, as it requests this report with Looker. It says, hey, this is actually the, the filter. So there's, there's access filters, and then there's actually kind of, we call them cosmetic filters, just like additional filters, and the filter is just where table name equals uh, right. no, X, Y, Z. And this is the URL. It's kind of a signed URL, what you can back get back, and the signed URL is what's loaded in the iframe. Yeah. 
And the use case here is that a data engineer would would look at like who's accessing and how much uh, how many bytes are being used on that table and be able to optimize um, format or pipeline of the table. So we see we see the uh, correct the short answer. Uh, I think the little bit longer answer we see this data discovery tool as kind of one of the main front ends when hey I'm dealing with tables I'm searching tables or I'm the owner of a table. Yes, there's the typical cataloging features and also you know, features like flagging TPI data, which we haven't addressed yet. Uh, but for us, it's this diagnostic insight and we'll soon have lineage. And you know, we, we have the data, but haven't worked on it enough. We have people have queried this table, have also queried this other table. It's kind of this Amazon.com uh, use case. Um, which can be really interesting if you think of data discovery of, oh, people who search for shipments also search for orders. Um, and uh, those are early ideas. I don't think they will manifest within the next six months, but rather afterwards when the tool is a little bit more mature. Uh, but that's where we're going. So it's it's a lot of self-service insights for the users of the platform. It's, it's many personas, actually, what we're addressing there. Awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> Other questions? Last call. All right. Thank you, Marcus. Really appreciate you sharing the demo and really cool work there. All right. Thanks a lot for listening. I'm looking forward for interacting with the community. Yeah. Uh, we'll spend a few minutes on the next agenda item, which is roadmap uh, from Lyft. I think some people were curious as to where Lyft's headed. Um, I can share that the next six months of Lyft are focused on two things. The first one is integrating dashboards in Amundsen. Lyft uses mode analytics pretty heavily. And so just the same way you can search for uh, tables as well as people, uh, we want to be able to search for existing dashboards that exist in Lyft. Uh, and so that's something that's uh, being worked on right now. We'll probably only create the mode integration first, but I think it should probably our hope is that it's easily accessible to other things like Looker and Tableau and so on. Uh, the next big thing that we're working on, that's uh, it's not exactly clear what we're going to do about it, but the topic is that of trust. A lot of people find data in Amundsen and Lyft, but don't quite know if that table is still being populated um, or if the table is still trustworthy and the right table for them to use. And so there will be some work of uh, making it more visible which tables um, are trustworthy or not. And this would be a combination of automated, automated signals, like when was the table last populated, um, or when was the last query run on this table, stuff like that. Uh, but also, perhaps some manual curation where someone can go in, uh, maybe the owner can go in and say, like, hey, this table is deprecated, don't use. Um, so those are the two big things we're working on in the next six months. Thank you. We are very, very interested in the mode integration at iRobot. So right. we also use mode. So uh, basically, we're sort of planning out our next six months um, and trying to figure out, you know, if we should focus some efforts there um, or where you were, um, because that's that's a big thing for us as well. Awesome. We're also really interested to hear where you land for trust. Um, I think that is going to, as we get more users in there, we're definitely getting a lot of questions. Um, and something that Christine and I have been working on um, is thinking about life cycling and versioning of tables and how we represent that information. Like you said, when a table has been deprecated um, or a new column was added or a column was deprecated, things like that. Um, so nothing specific yet, um, but that's probably something we'll be working on the next six months. Awesome. Um, Anything to add, Christina? She's on mute. <laughs> Nothing to add to that. All right. Um, I actually had, um, so unless someone else has something, I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about what, what are other things people are interested in that we could do in our next community meeting. So open forum, um, if you are things that you think you are worthy of sharing or things that you want to know more about, um, this is a great time to share those. Uh, could you uh, give a little more details on how you plan to uh, build this trust factor? Because I think that's a really, uh, that's a very nice initiative that uh, you're putting, uh, you're coming up with, and uh, it's a huge problem for us to 
so if you can share more details in the next community meeting, if that's possible, that would be really nice. Yeah, that sounds great, Omar. Thank you. Anything else? I would love to hear from the community members um, sort of who their target audiences are for their implementations of um, Amundsen within their companies, like how many people they have using it, if they've launched it, um, what some of the primary like use cases are, because I think we all have a lot of overlap, but some differences, and that's helpful to understand sort of what's driving priorities um, for everyone making contributions. Yeah, that's a good idea. So it's almost like Amundsen by numbers and personas within each company. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, we could do that maybe as a poll as well. Sure, yeah. yeah. What were you saying, Daniel? Maybe as a, as a follow-up to this, because uh, as in my case, uh, I, I didn't introduce yet Amundsen to the company. I would be interested in hearing about how people like for people that had success in introducing a monsoon to their companies what were what were the things that worked well for them uh, you know what is a good path to introducing a monsoon yeah um i think michelle would be actually a great person to talk about that in a later meeting talk about her uh, her process to getting that into iroba I'd love to. Um, I will start chatting with my the teams at iRobot to make sure I can uh, share what I'd like to. Great. Thanks, Daniel. What else? Uh, I think like uh, live internally, like Tamika is driving that, is like building a new search UI experience. I'm not sure that we covered that in a previous uh, community meeting, but but we could do a demo once in the next meeting, once we have more. Uh, currently, we are testing out and get some UX user early feedback, but I think in next community meeting, we could also do a demo on that one. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you mean the new UI for, for Amundsen? Uh, for the search one. So basically, we, we are adding a bunch of like, search filtering instead of uh, just a generic search bar. Yeah, it, uh, in, in the navigation bar, you mean? Uh, so, sorry, can you repeat your question? When? Uh, the search bar in the navigation, in the nav bar. Uh, yeah. I think, yeah, it's already there in the master branch, I guess. Uh, we have deployed that recently. Uh, not just that. So basically, it's adding a bunch of, uh, if you will see the current new UI, it has only like data set and people. You add adding a bunch of new fields to allow you to do more combination of search. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think it would be nice if, uh, if I would give a quick update on, on, on the ING side, <clears throat> what we are doing. Uh, first thing really important, uh, I will be presenting our data ecosystem in, in Big Data Conference in Poland next month. Uh, that would include the data ingestion, metadata repository, Apache Atlas, and of course, Amundsen, and how we are using uh, Amundsen with Atlas. Uh, we would cover all those things in the Big Data Conference for so. Uh, next one. Sounds uh, great. Yeah, the second one is uh, we are hardly working on the on the search relevancy because uh, that's really a pain point for us at the moment uh, to to have the proper search relevancy for the search results. Um, um, I would get back to I would get I, I can explain it in the details. What do what do we really want in terms of search relevancy? Like the manage table versus users table or the project table. Uh, how to find the more relevant results if someone would search for a particular table, these kind of things. Um, awesome. And the third one is, um, um, it's, yeah, it's really a small feature, but we are working on getting the user detail from the Active Directory uh, because that's our single source of truth. So our, in the metadata, in the metadata microservice, I would simply extend the function to have a customizable injection function uh, using the configuration. And uh, using that function, you would be able to uh, to get the user details from whatever system you are using. Yeah, sounds great. Cool. Well, we are on time. I want to thank everybody for their time. Uh, early morning, late evening. Appreciate all the input and conversation. Especially thanks to Marcus and the Square team for showing their work. And look forward to talking more on Slack. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for having us.
Take care, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone.